All right, we have um, about 30 minutes for uh, discussion, Q&A. Um, what I thought I would do is uh, maybe try to use a system where if you put your card like that, um, it means that you want to speak. Uh, and I'll try my best to, to try to get you in the order in which you did that. Um, since my card is up first, I'm going to take, <laughs> <laughs> take the opportunity maybe to pose questions and our, our well done in putting our, our three speakers together as a mini panel in the, uh, in the U. Um, so thanks to NHGRI, we have a, a really prolific ecosystem of genomic medicine implementers with um, Ignite, Emerge, Insight, Caesar, and at least in Ignite, I know we have 17 affiliate uh, groups, um, and, uh, um, and I'm sure there are many others across the other networks. And then there's uh, implementation going on that we simply don't know about, and there's a global community that's implementing genomic medicine. So I guess my, my question is really, how do we harness um, the knowledge that's being gained across those communities in a way that allows for us to be more effective going forward? Um, and I'd like to also just pose the question of what action can we take coming out of this meeting that will give us something tangible that we can begin doing to, to harness that wealth of knowledge. I, I don't know if David, Lori, or Alana, you want to respond to that. So I think one, um, oh, I'm happy to get started out. Um, so, so I think often the uh, getting folks together to talk about what are common measures that we can identify that we could potentially use across different uh, observations, across different studies, uh, would be a great thing. So we've talked at the NCI, one of, one of the things that the Cancer Moonshot gave to us was um, the, the uh, impetus for thinking about big data <clears throat> and thinking about what a cancer data ecosystem would look like. And the broad uh, discussion has been primarily around uh, the individual sort of biologic level as opposed to the system level. I would love to see getting folks around the table and, and in the broader community together to say, what would that ecosystem look like that enables us to capture similar data across different health uh, settings, across different populations, et cetera? I'm not sure the degree to which that's happened to this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, folks around the table might be able to tell me, but I, I would say that that's a, that's a logical starting point. Because mm -hmm. I think until we get there, we're all measuring different things at different times, and we can't pool it together as well. So, so I know um, a number of uh, the uh, networks that I mentioned are also um, developing standards. I'm not completely convinced that they're working across one another, to your point. So, um, so thanks for that. Any other comments for, from Lori or Alana on that? We've got a lot of other questions uh, around the table, if, if not. Yeah, I mean, maybe we could, yeah, I think I completely agree with David's comment. That was the whole point of kind of what we were doing with the Ignite Wet Network is, are there things that are common to genomic medicine implementations, regardless of what the specific intervention is, that we could measure? And I showed you the list of constructs, and we were actually able to, to act get a lot of those from our sites once we were able to sit down and talk about what they meant and why they were important and how we would collect them, we were actually able to do that, which I think was a remarkable achievement given we didn't go into that grant with that idea, but it evolved over time. And I think that that could happen at the broader community level as well, for sure. Again, the same thing holds true for um, as we've started looking at um, putting a framework around the eMERGE network as well because everybody is implementing the return of results but using slightly different processes, adapting it to their own setting and putting a framework around it allows us to look at that across the sites instead of um, looking like everybody's doing something totally different. Thanks. Okay, so I've got Rex, Bob. Howard, Bob, uh, these two guys over here whose names I can't read, and then Stephen. So let's start with um, Rex. So, so one of the things that, uh, I mean, we've heard several times in the presentations that you talked about was you've seen one thing, you've seen one thing. And we're talking about really implementation of genomic medicine, which often occurs with an N of one situation. So I'm struggling as how do you match the N of one environment and the you've seen one thing, you've seen one thing paradigm 
and then how do you go about implementing? And maybe the answer is these common measures that you've just been talking about, but uh, it, it still seems to me that's one of the biggest challenges that we face is how do we match this end of one world with a paradigm that allows you to make cross-system comparisons. Well, uh, my first thought would be contextualizing it, right? So your N of one is probably pretty similar to somebody else's N of one, is similar to somebody else's N of one. And if you were to put the framework around it, to say you measure these things so that I understand what's going on with that particular patient and how that pathway happened, other people who are in a similar situation would be able to take advantage of that. And now the adaptations might be slightly different from individual to individual. The idea that there's some common understanding of what's happening they will converge over time. Yeah, and I think there's also uh, a lot to be gained for people trying in different settings some quite similar strategies. And so I think there's both the potential, there's sort of common ingredients of context that can be measured. There's also common ingredients of the approach that individuals are taking to trying to get this taken up setting by setting by setting. And so I think there is convergence in the same way that these 61 or now 70, 80, 90 different models started from different places but are often saying the same things based on observations of a variety of different settings of illnesses of clinicians, et cetera. Just to follow up on that, uh, do you have any sense of what N is needed for this convergence to actually occur? <laughs> so I, I think it's always going to depend on what's the, what's the question that we're asking. Um, what's up? <laughs> <And I stopped. laughs> but, you know, but I think, you know, again, in, in the same way as we're used to powering trials that are focusing on individuals, we have trials that are powered focusing on other individuals, providers. We have um, you know, uh, trials that are powered on the, at the clinic setting. The challenge, of course, is that at, at some point, our one becomes the universe, and it's hard to randomize the universe. Um, maybe people will try. I would just expand on that a little bit in saying it, it's not, it's sort of a different way of, of thinking so that the, yes, the, the N of one, rather than discounting that N of one is by using standard frameworks and reporting structures and outcomes and comparing those N of ones, as David just said, till you get your um, bigger universe. Uh, that's, that's the point of looking at it this way, is so that that N of one doesn't become just a, oh, you're that N of one, we can't use your data. That data is just as important as this other N of one data and this other N of one data, and that's what's gonna move the field forward faster and help us implement genomic medicine or anything more effect efficiently and effectively. Let's move on to Bob Nussbaum. Those are wonderful talks. I, I learned a lot. Thank you. Um, I was struck, David, by the comment you made about who is it that coordinates all this care. And um, what I was struck by in all of your presentations was they were very dispassionate, but I think the patients were all passive receivers of interventions. And I didn't see how the patients were actually being factored in as active movers, because they are. Yeah, I think that it's, it's a wonderful point. And again, I think one of the challenges is, is sometimes we have uh, days and weeks to talk about these things, and so in the 20 minutes, one is selective. But other ways in which uh, that point exactly has been front and center, I, I've, I've used this cartoon um, that has this person who's selling uh, snow cones in a very cold place, and someone else sort of taps them on the shoulder and says, it's not or demand, it's supply and demand, and it's exactly to make the point that too often we make that assumption that we know exactly what's needed as opposed to starting with the person who presumably all this is intended to benefit and saying what is it that would be most helpful. So, uh, but, but yeah, it's a great point to say that it, it, was, uh, it was an end around, I guess. But, yeah. And, and I would also say, too, that, um, you know, while I think a lot of our, our talks did focus on the, the more organizational and, and setting level, um, some of the point of these, these models and, and frameworks is to remind us to move beyond that, uh, that focus on just 
the intervention being effective to improve a health outcome for an individual patient and look at is it also feasible in the context of your healthcare setting. Um, so it's not an either or, it's all of it. Patient and the setting and the providers and the staff and the broader environment. So again, and, and PCORI is, is doing a lot with, with that, making sure that the patients are engaged in this process. And so there are another place that we can look to. Thanks, uh, Howard. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks for making me uh, hungry for a Brazilian steak. Um, by you, 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 when you tilt, when you put it up, it means you want another portion. <laughs> when you're out of so, I was wondering where that was that, coming Jeff. from. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I, was, I know we have a break coming up, but anyway, yeah, you can have chicken or you know, skip the uh, chicken hearts, though. Um, <laughs> one, one of the things in oncology that we've had a problem with is rapid adoption is usually more driven by economics and champions uh, than it is by process, and we suffer from that um, in in terms of almost everything we have now. Um, in terms of certainly on the therapeutic side, but uh, how do we drive away from a semi-panic implementation, which is let's get something going, which is why we have so much disparity even within an institution, towards something that's more process oriented. And I think you know, the frameworks are nice if you have the time to sit there and talk them through, but typically a study comes out, KRAS is now mandatory, <coughs> if you want to prescribe cetuximab and get it paid for, and, and, um, and therefore it is done. Um, and certainly precision medicine is just full of that sort of thing. I'd love to get your thoughts on like, how, do we, how do we practically move away from this, uh, th this, uh, this lack of strategy? That's, a, that's an easy, no. <laughs> Incredibly challenging question. So I, uh, I mean, a couple of things come to mind. So one of which is to what degree can we at least be able to use these rapid experiments to learn from. So how can we, by studying the ways in which we are doing the best that we possibly can given these external influences and learn from them in terms of what's going well. Usually it's a longer process than that initial step, so I think that we can use those natural experiments to try and learn from. But the other thing I think is a broader way in which, uh, you know, and that was that, that very quick shot of the learning healthcare system and, and precision medicine and implementation science coming together is to think about, you know, again, it may not be the, the latest crisis or the latest thing, but to think about over time, how are our systems built to take on these things, which I don't think we've always done such a great job of. And so, to some degree, expecting that the next thing that we have to deal with is gonna pop up in the next couple of months pushes us away from at least saying, oh, this is a crisis that's already on us. So again, I think there have been other industries that have said, how do we re-engineer our system so that it is able to account for the uncertainty that's coming in the future? And I don't know that we've done that as well. So that's just too quick. Yeah. Actually, your second point was exactly what I was gonna say, is if you put in place your infrastructure, so you know you're gonna need the ability to do specific genetic tests in order to drive the chemotherapy for your patients. If you put into place the framework, and, and we know that you know champions are great, but they are definitely not sufficient, right? It just makes things very scattered and um, dysfunctional. So if you have an entire, you understand the ecosystem, you understand what, it, what does it take when you need to add a new genetic test? Who in the lab needs to be involved? How does that process happen? Who, who needs to have the buy-in? So if you have that whole process thought through, each time they come out with some new paper that says you need to, by the way, add this, you already have an implementation infrastructure in place and the buy-in from the health system that you're gonna be able to adapt more quickly. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, but you have a process for adaptation that's at least um, controlled. And it's great for the places that are in this room. I'm thinking of, I mean, the, you know, at our place we have an implementation department and it doesn't matter if it's a new scan or new new test, but most care uh, for all everything, not just cancer, is out in the community, and there just is not the time to think, much less do. Yes, but they're also not doing KRAS testing for most. No, they are really. because they don't get paid otherwise. Yeah. Mm. 
They don't get, they, they adopt, uh, precision medicine has been adopted in the community way faster than the academic setting. And so, because huh. of these other drivers. So that's, you know, some of the challenges that are there. So I would add on that too, and, and you know, the, my question to you would be then, um, if the inf do you have the infrastructure in place that there's at least some of that data, you know which, pa because you have to know which patients got the KRAS testing so you can get paid for that, do you have the ability to pull that and say then, yes, we know that all of our patients are getting KRAS testing, or that they're not, so you know that there are some providers who still aren't doing it, don't want to get, apparently don't want to get paid for it. Um, you know, but again, using the, the other half of this is the evaluation. Using that data that you're already looking at, because you're already saying, okay, if I have to use this to get paid, I have to know that my patients are getting it so that my community setting is getting paid. You can report on that and what's happening, and that helps the broader community with the, um, the one thing that David touched on too, which is the de-implementation. What isn't working? Thanks for that. Um, just one take-home message I got out of that discussion was that how much financial um, pressures and uh, are really um, what may be driving a, a significant driver of implementation, particularly not outside of the non-academic community. Uh, next is Bob Wilden. Uh, thanks also for all those wonderful talks. I'm 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 really interested in digging into this deeper, and so glad to see that the links and so forth on the slides. Um, I recently was reading a paper where um, an implementation framework was used and it seemed very complicated and challenging for me because I'm not used to it. And, um, and I began to think about what is, what is the evidence that a framework like this actually helps things move forward as opposed to, say, uh, um, guided chaos. Um, and, and I think if I was trying to do something in my own institution and went to a clinician and said, I need you to participate with this because it's a systems thing, they would say the same as they would say if when I go to them and say, let's do pharmacogenomics, they say, what's the, what's the clinical utility? So that's my question. What's the, what's the evidence? So. Yes. One of the things I wanted to, to say to your, your question is not, there, there's a lot of evidence that the, the frameworks and the, the constructs within those frameworks are you, work and are useful um, for implementing evidence into practice or implementing uh, things into any change. Um, but one of the other things that you brought up was this, you go to a clinician and they're gonna tell you, I don't do research, I don't wanna do this. But, and I think that's why there's been so much work into the pragmatic use of REAIM. And, and I will, full disclosure, REAIM is, is my first implementation science language. Um, I worked with Russ Glasgow, so I sort of ingrained it into my being. Um, but it's very simple, it's very approachable, and they've used over time this prag more pragmatic structure to facilitate that conversation rather than going to a clinician and saying, hey, we need to use this framework and, and look at it specifically these outcomes. Who are you trying, just questions, who are you trying to reach? What is the benefit you're trying to create? And you can show then how this, wants, that everything that they want to do fits in this framework and here's how we can then turn around and present it. So that it's useful information not only for you clinically but for the researchers and the, the broader generalizability of it. Uh, I would just say, I mean, there are over 100 studies that have shown that using an implementation framework is very heavily used in mental health. Um, but the ICU infections was a, is a sort of the perfect example of how that's useful. Also, um, there have been a number of studies in cost effectiveness for blood transfusions where they use an implementation framework and greatly decrease the costs um, for, for the health system. So I, I'm happy to give you like, a whole bunch of them, but, but there are a lot out there. They just aren't always sort of tagged as this is an implementation science study, and so you don't always know that that's, um, the benefits were due to that. Okay, um, I've got Peter, Lincoln, Stephen, Dan, Bruce, Terry, and then Casey. So, Peter. 
Thank you. So uh, great to talk, uh, start with implementation science. And this dovetails a little bit with um, Howard's comments. A lot of this is happening at the community level, and that's including our organization. We've been trying, as we try to implement different pathways, to bring more rigor to that, both internally with implementation science. And it's interesting, too, with this concept of de-implementation, because we try some things and realize, hey, that didn't work the way we thought, and we need to pivot a little bit. My challenge is we do have some internal funding and we're looking for external sources, but the typical NIH cycle for funding these types of projects or just projects in general really isn't realistic for an organization like ours that needs to make a decision, hey, we need to shift gears because of other pressures, as Howard mentions. Is there a novel way or thought process to this uh, roadmap where there may be other sort of callous funding in this space to help um, us bring this information to the sort of the general academic knowledge as well? Uh, so great question, and, and I think, you know, no matter even, even when uh, some of our institutes and centers at NIH have done these sort of rapid mechanisms, it's still not rapid or as rapid as, as we would really like. Um, one of the concepts that we uh, presented publicly so that we can talk about it um, as, part of our, as part of this moonshot effort is to create uh, these broader sort of implementation science centers. Uh, and I, I mentioned on one of those slides that precision medicine might be this really lovely example of how this could be particularly useful because it's evolving so rapidly. Part of that is this idea of setting up these natural laboratories to study implementation, and it would be thinking about what kinds of community or clinical sites might be willing to partner together and with researchers and have much more fluidity in terms of being able to identify as a center pilot studies and moving things forward. So that's along those lines, and I think it's an ongoing challenge for all of our you know, agency folks to say how do we balance between the work that needs a little bit more time to be fully fleshed out and the emergent need that comes in community and clinical settings and probably useful to any of our strategic planning efforts over these days. Um, just along those lines, I know that Muin is not here today, but he published, um, you know, a, a few years ago, a data that suggested that the funding of T3, T2, T3, and beyond research was, uh, the NIH was 2% or less, maybe even at NCI. How has that changed, maybe um, from your perspective or perhaps Eric's in terms, has there been a shift to the right, in a sense, of the funding along the translational pathway? So I guess the, the quick answer is we have seen increases broadly in terms of, in, in terms of funding. I don't have an, uh, we, we do our portfolio analyses um, that look at the trajectory over time and, and certainly we've seen increases as well as more people who maybe their primary question is around the effectiveness of an intervention, including questions about implementation. So it's both sort of expanding those solely focus on implementation and expanding implementation focus within other parts, but it's still going to be relatively small. And the biggest driver from my experience has always been what's the denominator of studies that are coming in that we can fund. So across NIH, we have typically a success rate and typically percentiles. The higher the denominator is in a given area, it seems like the more ability there is to fund studies. But if we have too few studies or if people say, you know, uh, I'm not sure this would get funded and don't apply, then there's no way they can be funded. Um, we also do have a standing study section that specifically focuses on implementation. And so that's been an effort to try and drive more, but I don't know if others want to make comments, but typically it, it operates the larger the size of the community, the larger uh, work we can get done. Yeah, I, I think to date, much of this has been institute-initiated rather than investigator-initiated for many of the reasons that David, uh, you know, elucidates in, in that the peer review system sort of isn't ready for this or isn't seeing yeah. it as being, you know, ready for prime time. And that's a real challenge, but the only way to get it there is to keep knocking on the door. Right. Lincoln? So, you know, there's been this ongoing debate, and we even talked about it this morning, about how much evidence is needed to really uh, justify implementation of genomic medicine in various verticals. And um, I'm increasingly suspicious, as I think others are, that there isn't a single, you know, randomized phase three study we can conduct that will convincingly result in uh, the data we need to implement genomic medicine. It, I, I think increasingly it's just becoming, I think it almost has to be something of an executive strategy at some of these institutions where they decide. We think that uh, the metadata is sufficient that we're going to do this for patients. Um, and so I'm really intrigued, Alana, by what you had to say about the experience at Geisinger 
and, and uh, using the 59 ACMG genes, and you're gonna be sequencing patients, and that you're gonna be targeting just the GHP patients initially. And so did you go and have a conversation with, with the GHP leadership, or, or how, how did you decide, I'm guessing that GHP is gonna pay for that, and what was that conversation like, and how did you decide on that strategy to target those patients first? So th this was a strategy, um, it was decided by the group that decided they wanted to implement this program and, and try it and see what we could, if it could be done. Um, and the health plan had said, well, we need to take on that risk um, because we can't ask other health plans to pay for this if it doesn't work. Um, I don't know if there's a better way to say that. Mark. Yeah, uh, I, it, it's actually beyond health plan. It's Geisinger employees who are covered under Geisinger health plan. And I think the piece that we forget about um, is that most of the insurance decisions made in this country are made by employers. Employers are like Geisinger that are large employers are self-insured. So they're actually their own insurer. And so when we think about this, we think about what is, where's the biggest return, what we call the sweet spot. And so if we have uh, issues where a health-related issue might impact uh, a person's ability to be at work uh, or be effective when they're at work, presenteeism, absenteeism, that's a cost to the system. There's the actual medical cost, the insurance cost to the system, and then there's the uh, uh, personal cost to the individual and to that individual's family. And so we think if we can operate in that sweet spot, that's where we can have the, show the biggest uh, return uh, on the investment. And so that's why the um, uh, decision was made when we wanted to launch this clinically to go to the health plan. And the health plan uh, has something called a quality initiative. So um, they recognize that when the system provides better care, they actually run a higher margin. And so part of their contribution back to the system is to say, we want you to do more of this. We think that this is a virtuous cycle, so they invest in it. And this gets to Peter's uh, point too, which is, you know, we don't look to the NIH to yep. do this sort of rapid cycle, because they're not set up to do that. If we have an interesting research question, then we'll go to NIH. But this is an institutional commitment, which I think, Lincoln, you were also um, uh, alluding to. Um, we, we have to invest in this, but the, the payoff is that if we actually invest in this, we do it better, and we can actually measure the return to the system. Uh, and, if, and, and piecemeal implementation always costs more than thoughtful implementation from the, from the system perspective. So in some ways it's a cultural change that we've been through and Intermountain has been through and that other systems haven't quite gotten to yet, but that's the, that's the way we approach it and that's the reason why uh, we have willing partners to say, you know, we want to go ahead and move forward with this because the research project that you'll hear more about this afternoon has convinced us that there's real value here. And I, I actually, so I actually think this is a huge key to how genomic medicine can be implemented at scale, right? And, and there isn't a single research study that any of us can publish that is going to convince everyone to go and now implement this. The barriers are really significant, and so it becomes a question of can you present sufficient data to your partners on the payer side that this is worth implementing with the promise that you will measure outcomes and return those outcomes back to the payer, uh, and it does become that virtuous cycle, and then you gain enormous credibility and you can begin to argue for additional implementations. I think also patient uh, demand is going to be a driver in this space yeah. too because we see it certainly and you know eventually if enough exactly. patients are demanding this, um, you know, right or wrong, like, you know, we have to guide them but that's going to be a significant factor. So how do we educate the patient on the promises and the versus the hype? That's right and, and that's part of where the executive strategy comes in is, is executive level decisions can be made based on consumer demand, right? And, that, and they're responsive to that. Yeah, actually in, um, in our first genomic medicine meeting, GM1, one of the key drivers that we found across the communities that were already beginning to implement genomic medicine were the fact that the C-suite, the CEOs or CSOs of those organizations had embraced it and said, we're going to take the risk. Uh, so I've been told by the boss that I can go over time a little bit since there's some changes in the schedule a little later today that will uh, not make us late for anything. So I'd like to see if I can get as many of the additional questions in as possible. So next, I think, is Stephen or David. I can't didn't remember, didn't see whose sign was up. Thanks, Jeff. Um, really awesome stuff, and I look forward to getting those slides. Um, it really strikes me that um, this field of implementation science 
uh, is ripe for NHGRI engagement. As you know, as I've listened and looked through some of the URLs that you suggested, it does seem to me that there's a lack of interoperability uh, amongst these various frameworks. And at least for genomic medicine, it does seem to me uh, under this NHGRI remit that there ought to be certain characteristics that define optimal framework choices. And something that maybe would be a helpful offshoot of this conference would be just a, a gathering to actually determine what are the critical components of a framework uh, for genomic medicine implementation. Um, you know, it strikes to me, me that we need both cost and outcomes, that those are really critical. We need both dissemination and implementation. And we need to stretch from individual benefits all the way up to policies. And as I look at the choices that there are, I'm, I'm not sure there's something that's really tailor-made. Um, so I guess I'm supposed to ask a question. And so my, <laughs> my practical question would be, given all of that, you know, you've given us two examples of genomic medicine initiatives in um, Ignite and Geisinger, where you did choose a singular framework with CIFR and REAIM. Could you um, explain how you made those choices? Um, and, and to what extent you would agree with me that we need maybe a custom interoperable set of guidance in terms of uh, as, as a community where we should go with this as opposed to, you know, selecting one off the shelf? So I will say, I completely agree with you, right? So that's what we kind of did when we went through CIFR and we said, oh, look, the patient's really missing from this part. And sorry, I can't lift the I know, speak I know. into the microphone. Yeah, it's, it's really um, <laughs> but uh, so, so yes, we completely agree that there needs to be some customization. And so we kind of tried to start that process. And then I, I should have said that Caesar also is in the process of doing this. and. And they were kind enough to want to learn from the work that we did in Ignite. And so we've kind of incorporated the things that we were doing in Ignite with the things that they're doing there to try to come up with a new sort of updated genomic medicine model. And um, I know Carol's working on a paper that I'm supposed to be writing. So <laughs> um, anyway, I think that, that bringing the communities together to continue to build this, this knowledge is, would be, I think, ideal way to go. And I'm not sure, we, we picked CIFR just because it was very broad and didn't define, uh, limit the constructs that we could look at. And so to answer the last part of the question first is how did we choose REAIM? Um, for both uh, eMERGE and the, sorry, I can't turn and speak into the microphone either. Um, for both eMERGE and the, um, for eMERGE it was because it um, was an, and it was, help to answer the question of everybody's doing something different, how do, we, how do we look at those adaptations and measure them across the sites? And so it was a, a framework that helps us do that. Um, same thing with the clinical sequencing is it was a way to show how we, re-aim fit to show how we can take the questions that they're already asking and the outcomes that they want to use and put them into a framework that is then reportable and with the, the guidance to say, here's the things that you need to report that you're already collecting data on, how you can report them in a way that makes sense to you. So it was really giving a framework so that instead of it looking like the Wild West that we're just throwing it out there, that here's a framework that helps you really put some, some structure around it. Um, and that also, what I will say with the, um, you know, with what's going on with the other networks, using CIFR, all of this, there are lots of models out there, and I don't know that it's a matter of finding the one model. It's the, more like Lori's checklist idea, the point isn't the checklist, the point isn't the model. The point is putting the structure around it and what are those things we want to make sure that are, all, that are measured and reported upon. The framework or the structure that you use to do that may vary based on, or the framework may f that fits may vary based on your question or your study or your project that you're implementing. I just have one 
other thing. Based on the conversations that we were having earlier, I think one of the challenges that genomic medicine has that's very different from anything else, most of these implementation studies are things that are not expensive to do. Hand washing in the ICU is not an expensive intervention or are um, things that will decrease the cost to the health system, and there's no reason for a payer to be involved in the decisions around these implementations. I think it's very rare that, that in genomic medicine where you're so beholden to the payer because it's so expensive and there's such a large infrastructure that needs to go around it. And, and because of that uniqueness to genomic medicine, I think it really does take something at a higher level than the individual. So in your case, you know, thinking about the community people, if there was some sort of broader um, network or infrastructure that was available to them at a higher level so that when these things came out, they could just tap into and say, okay, now I've got my built-in pathway to do what I need to do. But that's a different level of commitment. But I think based on what people are saying is that's what you really need to make this work. That's just my thoughts. Thanks. So we've got uh, Dan, Bruce, Terry, and Casey, and then I think we're, we'll be at the end. So Dan? So I've been, I've been listening to the, the back and forth, and, uh, and I'm not sure what my question is, but I couldn't <laughs> resist the opportunity to say something. Um, <laughs> so one, one thought was, what my, my, actually, my initial question was going to be to Alana, and that is sort of the the mechanics of implementing the ACMG 59 in the Geisinger Health System. So uh, how many people, who pays for it, uh, how do you return, what do you return, those, those kinds of things. Okay, so, but, but I mean, I, but I, but, so I would echo what I think Lori just said, and that is that this appears to only happen in institutions where the leadership has drunk this Kool-Aid along with us. Yeah. And, and each one of us has sort of a different twist on that. So you have your ACMG 59 and we have PREDICT. But I mean, the idea is that, that um, we're, we're all sort of learning these lessons in a different way, as opposed to the cancer space where there's this tight link to therapeutics. You can't prescribe expensive drug X without doing genetic test Y. So, um, the, the problem I think that we have in implementing genomic medicine uh, from cradle to grave is, is that we don't have a single payer system. Um, we don't have a person who's going to be a steward of those genetic information, that genetic information across the span of a lifetime. And, uh, and we don't know exactly what to use when. So, you know, this is a problem in pharmacogenomics, it's a problem in the rare variant genomic stuff. Uh, and, and so I think that we're ending up very, uh, being a fragmented community and maybe one way forward is to sort of have meetings like this where we decide as a community, you know, wh where do we put our oomph and I'm not sure how to do that but, but that's, the, that's the sort of fundamental problem that I see right now and, and uh, I wish more people would, would drink that Kool-Aid. Yeah, and it might, uh, we might also learn from uh, other systems outside the United States that well, are, uh, that again, are. Again, who have the sort of, you know, I hate to sort of be a, is sort of a complete pessimist, but who, who do have single payer systems for better or worse. Right. And, and, and who do have mechanisms to aggregate these very, very large data sets. I mean, yep. that's, that's the other part of the cancer business, that, that by, by making people contribute data to very large common data sets, everybody gets smarter about what variants do what, and we're not quite there yet, even in the pharmacogenomic space. Dan, I just jump in here though and say, uh, yeah, I agree with you completely, but the problem is those people are not in the room today, and we need to figure out how to address that, I think. I mean, we can all go back and be as persuasive as we're capable of to our guys, but yeah. Okay, uh, Bruce, I think was, uh, yes, Bruce, you're next. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful. Um, so I think the discussion has focused on um, implementation into the existing sort of paradigm of um, medical care, um, and maybe that's the scope of this meeting, but I'm wondering where disruptive innovation fits into the picture, and I guess that could be things like direct-to-consumer testing or app-based medicine or social media, and I suppose we could let natural selection take its course for those things, realizing it's possible that we'll be the victims of it. 
or is there a way to harness the implementation sort of science approach into this larger sphere than just existing medical care systems? I think so. Um, I, I, I think that in, you know, all across uh, medicine, most of the NIH institutes have the, you know, studies that are looking at this particular app or this newer approach or direct-to-consumer advertising in some limited scope, and we haven't necessarily thought about how to put those together. It's such a rapidly evolving and expanding base. The uh, idea, and that, that was that thing, starting from, if anyone still has that mindset that the best way to inform a population is through that initial peer review, obviously um, we're a few years past that. Uh, so, so I think it, it fits entirely into the space. I mean, broadly, I think implementation is really trying to understand what is able to be supplied, what is demanded, and how do we try to use all of the knowledge that we have uh, to try and drive toward better health and better health care. And so I think, you know, it is fragmented. There's so many different ways in which we can approach this. It's also understudied. So I think uh, we don't do nearly enough in our NIH portfolio to focus on dissemination and how information is transmitted through a whole range of different technologies as we should. Um, in cancer, we have a health communications branch. Most of NIH doesn't really think about, uh, at least in, in as, as vibrant a portfolio, about the ways in which communication is changing um, the need for care, the uh, request for care, et cetera. So yeah, to me, that's all part of this space. Okay, Terry. Um, so I want to, I want to agree with what, what David said and sort of and maybe build on it a bit. We, we ought to think a, a little bit about what we're asking for because it, it seems like early this morning we all sort of decried the fact that, that payers aren't paying for this and so we need to do research to show them that they should pay for that. Is that really the NIH's role? And then, and then we heard from Howard what happens when a payer mandates something that, you know, then there's this whole infrastructure need that, that needs to be had. And so, so you know, if the holy grail is, is actually getting people to pay for it, can, can, do we need to also to think about what happens once we have the grail and, and how, you know, how we drink from it in, in, in order to be able to, to get this to actually work for patients' benefits? David or, or others or Howard, but, uh, but, but it seems to me, you know, that was sort of the first time I ever thought about that was, oh my goodness, once they're paid for it, then we have a whole other set of problems to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, from our observations across a whole range of different uh, health topics, we have a lot of things that are paid for and, and people don't get. So it is, and, and people, you know, there have been tables that we've sat around where the issue has been all we need to drive for is that payment decision. Um, but because, particularly as we cascade outward and say, well, what is it that we actually need to provide in order to make this information used to the benefit of people? And it's far more than what we often start with, right? Uh, and so, yes, I think we see the economic aspects as necessary but insufficient, and that if we assume that that's our one audience, then we miss all of the other ways in which care is suboptimal and health is suboptimal. Yeah. And I think also we can use this to our advantage. Uh, one of the, there's been a massive improvement in our region for uh, lynch screening. And the improvement is not implementing of lynch screening. The improvement is MSI testing allows you to get immunotherapy. And so now everybody is getting uh, lynch screening not to find Lynch, but to find eligibility for immunotherapy, which finds a bunch of Lynch patients. And so can we harness the evil for good, if you want to call it that, <laughs> um, in terms of trying to make sure that we can get a lot of these things for, and it's, you know, if I knew how to do it, we'd already be doing it, but, um, you know, there, there are some opportunities emerging to kind of use, maybe inadvertently achieve our goals through a process that we didn't expect. To. If I can just add to that, though, I think one of the things that we consistently encounter, um, and, and maybe it's an oddity of an academic health system, but is, you know, we're all the true believers, right? But then you try to go to the primary care providers, and it's really hard for them to even think about how to do this. You know, we've all done experiments in our health systems where we try to implement um, pharmacogenomics, for example. You're biasing and the 430 debate. 
<laughs> isn't, isn't part the fundamental problem, and I'm looking at Eric now because this is sort of part of the fundamental problem of genome science is that we're, we're looking at large populations and trying to find small subsets of those populations that, because of their genetics, deserve different treatments, deserve a different approach to care. And that's going to be the fundamental problem with the payers, because the payers want a population approach. The payers are not interested in doing genetic, a thousand genetic tests to find one person who is different, or a million genetic tests to find one person who's different. So, so that's the problem that we should have end up grappling with, and, yeah, and, and, and need to think about in terms of you know, a strategy for going forward. Uh, although I think the, the ohm in our name, you know, answers the question. So, oh, so yeah, uh, so you do a thousand genetic tests and you find people who are at risk a thousand different ways. Yeah, no, no, but, I, but then you have to have a thousand different implementations. I know you know this, I'm speaking to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, um, I just want to, <laughs> let's, uh, we just yes, need to um, get to the, some closure on the, this session. So. Uh, I want to, Robert, do you have a quick follow-up to that, yeah, really just, quick? Just a quick thing. I mean, uh, the challenge also, uh, I love the theme of fragmentation, and the challenge is how do we take a public health perspective when this is fragmented across specialties, so OBGYN, cardiology, pharmacogenomics, all of that, and across time, because there's so much about genomic medicine that will, um, that will land across the decades of a person's life rather than in some narrow window like a treatment perspective. So I, I just want to keep those fragmentations in mind, and I'm curious whether implementation science has precedence for looking across specialties and across decades in the way that I think some of us believe genomic medicine will really find its true value. Yeah, so you were not allowed to ask a question. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it, but if you want to respond to that, that's fine. Uh, so. Yes, I, I think there, is, there, there has been limited within, and again, I think all the caveat is within some of the stuff that we've done at NIH because we end up being siloed into different mandates, different institutes, but there is precedence for it, and, and, and I would say that the best example is looking at all of the efforts to try and manage care for various chronic illnesses, and in some cases, multiple chronic conditions, which requires thinking about some of the, you know, Ed Wagner's chronic care model, thinking about broader across different systems, primary care specialty care, uh, allied health professionals, care managers, et cetera. Um, so I think there is, but it, it, I, I think it's how broad and how complex are a piece are we willing to take on? We need to, but it's a question of are there manageable components of that so that the study doesn't have to be the universe? So I think that's where, where our challenge has been. And the last question of the session will go to Casey. So I, I'll okay. keep it short since we have a session tomorrow where we get to talk a little bit more. Let's get closer to the mic, please. Um, so my question is um, ar around uh, how technology fits with the, with the framework. So I often do start with, um, with these different frameworks and models when I'm thinking about technology interventions, and I run into the the, the challenge of figuring out, okay, if, if it's not a perfect fit, can I make an adjustment? And so I thought it was great that uh, the, the paper that Lori brought up, they actually proposed additions to those models. And so I'm just curious how that went over and like what's that process when, when you have to kind of make those adjustments? Uh, well, first, um, one of the studies that came out while we were working on the CFER draft model was the ERIC, um, where they looked at all the different implementation strategies that are possible, and then they categorized them. And so technology is very heavily in, um, used as a implementation strategy. Clinical decision support, they claim as a implementation strategy, if you want to spread the awareness about how to um, respond to a particular patient and you get a pop-up alert in the EMR, that's actually a way of implementing that, that change in care for the patient. So, um, <clears throat> so, so they, we strongly believe that implementation and technology go hand in hand, particularly around genomics. But in terms of actually adapting the model, um, that, that's just a, you know, I get people emailing me still all the time saying, I'm interested in using the, this, this, and this, and you know, and what do you think? And then, 
we, we take that information and at some point, like we are now with Caesar, sort of publishing an, ad, you know, an updated version of what does this look like now that people have, have used some pieces of it and have feedback for us? Excellent. So um, in 30 seconds, I'm just going to summarize what I heard in the last 50 minutes. Um, headlines being uh, standards. Uh, we started off with uh, standard measures across uh, various implementing groups, including the patient voice, generalizability and dissemination, the need for infrastructure for implementation science, the need for funding for implementation science, having an executive strategy that engages the payer community, providing guidance to our community in terms of which implementation <laughs> frameworks might be optimal for genomic medicine, um, encouraging disruptive innovation outside of more inertia-based healthcare systems, and probably most importantly is the alignment of the economic in incentives to implement. So I think that was kind of some of the gestalt for, for today. And I want to thank our, our panelists and also the engagement of, of all of you for a terrific first session of this meeting. Thanks. And now. We're going to take a break, but I don't know when it ends. Yes, thanks, thanks very much, Jeff. I will tell you when it's going to end. So uh, we're going to take a break, and we'll come back at 1, at 1, at 11.15 to uh, reconvene. So, uh, but thanks, everybody. This was fabulous. <laughs>